I'm Jessica Collins, uh, Executive Director of the Public Health Institute of Western Mass, and am here with an amazing group of people. Uh, and we're so grateful for everyone's participation today uh, to learn of this important history and current reality of a very um, important public health issue. Uh, I want to just go over a few of the housekeeping uh, issues. If you have technical difficulties or need help, please send a direct chat to one of the hosts. We're recording the webinar and the recording will be emailed to registrants and posted on the Public Health Institute uh, website. When the webinar ends, we will ask that you, actually we have two surveys that we're asking people to fill out. One is after our first presenter, Michael Scott's presentation. And then at the end, we'll also be asking you to complete just a short survey about the webinar. And that is incredibly helpful for us um, as we uh, continue to provide webinars uh, on uh, public health issues. Um, so, the Public Health Institute of Western Mass in partnership with the Women of Color Health Equity Collective and the Mass Department of Public Health's uh, Mass Tobacco Control Program have been working together with many um, community members uh, around an issue of capacity building for racial equity. Uh, and we are very uh, honored to be able to have um, uh, technical assistance from national leaders uh, like Michael and others. And so very happy uh, to have you here with us today. This is an important uh, part of the journey around racial equity. And um, I'm gonna hand it over to my uh, very uh, uh, good friend, Wanda Givens, who I've known for 15 years. She is a lifelong resident of Springfield. She is a community activist for public health and she has made significant strides in our community around food access for the Mason Square community in particular. She was the founder of the Mason Square Health Task Force um, and is an original member and founder of the Western Mass Health Equity Coalition. She now is part of the Women of Color Health Equity Collective uh, and is coming to us from Florida at the moment, um, but is a lifelong, you know, heartfelt, a uh, community member here and Wanda, we're just so thrilled to have you uh, moderating for us today. So I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Jessica. That was quite an introduction and welcome everyone. I'm seeing names pop into the chat from people I haven't seen or talked to in quite a while. So it's great to have you all here. And we're really excited about this presentation today. I, uh, before I introduce our guest speakers, just let me let you know that we will be taking, we will have a Q&A at the end of both presentations. But if you're like me and can't always remember, we encourage you to uh, place your questions in the Q&A. You'll see that button on your Zoom screen. And we hopefully will get to those at the end. If we don't get a chance to respond to your question, we will do so in writing at some point and you, everyone will receive those questions and answers later. So with that, let's get started because I'm excited to hear our speakers. Our first speaker is Michael Scott. Michael oversees tobacco and cancer prevention and education programming at the Center for Black Health, e health and Equity. He has 18 years of public health experience on the national, state, and local levels. His work has focused on disease prevention in the areas of HIV, diabetes, cancer, and tobacco use. Prior to his position at the center, he served as a health education specialist at both the Durham County Department of Public Health and Duke University Medical Center. Mr. Scott holds a Bachelor of Science degree in health education from North Carolina Central University and is a certified health education specialist. Michael will be followed by Ms. Doris Cullen. Doris is a community engagement facilitator with the Massachusetts Tobacco Cessation and Prevention Program, MTCP, at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Doris has worked with MTCP for 28 years and has published articles related to tobacco product design and use rates. Most recently, Doris became actively involved in the MTCP efforts to expose, challenge, and dismantle structural racism in the social determinants of health, where we live, learn, work, and heal, which influenced the 
tobacco-related health inequities seen in the data. She is training as a racial equity facilitator, has facilitated white people challenging racism affinity groups, and is a member of the racial equity leadership team of the Bureau of Community Health and Prevention at MDPH. Welcome to both of our speakers. We are excited to hear you and I will turn it over to Michael. Thank you, thank you, and good afternoon to everyone who is on the call. Uh, I appreciate being invited and being able to share some information today. Um, what I'm gonna be talking about is really, it, it covers 400 years. So I'm gonna be giving a really a high level um, um, introduction of the, the history from, from slavery to, to where we are today, like today, as in the present day at, 12 o'clock. So it should be interesting. Um, I'll encourage folks to, um, you know, put some questions in the chat box and, and we'll have time for Q&A afterwards. And I'll be turning off my camera to save some bandwidth and begin sharing my slides. And hopefully I do this correctly. And just to be sure, are you seeing just my slides, correct? Yep. And awesome, awesome. So again, uh, today we're going to talk a bit, a bit about the history and covers a, a couple of centuries. So um, I, I'll be doing a high level overview and I encourage folks to either, you know, put Q questions in the Q&A or email me later if there's you know an, an expansion if you want if you want to hear more about it um a few of the topics have um trainings in and of themselves that we can provide to folks um so again it's not going to be it's not going to go as deep as we could but um i think it's going to be a, a lot of really good really good information so just to give some perspective um, when we talk about African Americans, racism, slavery, and how it impacts today, if we look at this this image, it, it breaks down how long African Americans have been in the United States and how long they've actually been free, been considered 100% equal citizens per se. So African Americans have been here for 246 years under slavery, 103 years or so under the restrictive Jim Crow laws. And in, in modern day where everyone is equal, everyone has access to the same things or supposedly has access to the same things. It's not even been a full 60 years. This slide's a, a couple of years old. So it's not even been 60 years that African Americans have been on the same playing field as the rest of the United States citizenship. And we'll talk about that a few slides in to, to really give it some perspective and why that's important. Um, so the, the, the mythos of you know, the American dream doesn't take that into consideration. The structural systemic racism experienced by African Americans, um, the fact that folks of European descent and even other nationalities that immigrated, you know, have almost a, a 300 year head start when it comes to health equities, education, um, access to, to, to all that, that provides that certain level of, of, of protection and certain level of access. And then you'll hear, well, my family immigrated here and, you know, well, it's, it's, it's different because again, the sentiment behind that I kind of get, but again, it doesn't take into the history and the context of these, these systems and policies and laws that actually prevented African Americans from obtaining their optimal health, their optimal wealth, their optimal policy making input, education, all of which we know directly relates to your health and health equity health inequities, I should say. So history-wise, we're gonna take it back to the 1600s when tobacco first became a cash crop 
um, here in the United States um, and really, truly built the economy of the United States as we know it today. And that's, that's an important point. Free slave labor is the backbone of today's economy. Now, the original workers in the New World um, were mainly indentured servants, but they weren't hurt, held in perpetual servitude. They signed contracts, they worked their time, and then they became free. They became equal. They were given land, livestock, supplies to start their own lives and become citizens, contributing citizens to the New World. Um, and again, like I said, tobacco in those days was that main cash crop. Uh, the, the demand from Europe was just grew exponentially. So demand for, for land, labor grew right along with it. So tobacco being a, a challenging crop to produce, you know, it requires year round attention. Once you've planted it, the soil needs to rest. Uh, so there are all these considerations to be made. The biggest consideration is was more labor is needed and cheaper labor is needed. Now, that brings us to the transatlantic slave trade, um, bringing captured African citizens to the United States against their will to work for free. So growing up, I always connected slavery to cotton but the truth is, the actuality is, tobacco was that impetus to the barbaric institution of, of chattel slavery here in the United States. And if not for the Civil War, which, yes, people are going to say, well, that was about states' rights. Yeah, it's states' rights to maintain slavery among some of the other rights they were um, wanting to maintain. If it wasn't for the Civil War, you know, slavery would, would have never ended. Now, when we talk about that need for cheap labor and, and Europeans finding it via the transatlantic slave trade, you know, we, we think about the images that we, we probably still see today, but definitely back in the day, TV, print ads, you know, National Geographic, you know, it, it, it many times portrayed Africa and Africans as backwards or, or primitive, when the truth of the matter is that was far from the case. Um, the African continent at that time was, was really recognized for their, their technological advancements, specifically in agriculture and craftsmanship. So keep that in mind, agriculture and craftsmanship. Where's that gonna come in handy? Um, and we can just look at the pyramids as an example. Uh, there are more pyramids in, in the Sudan, which I think we all know is in Africa, than, than in all of Egypt. Now, Egypt is in Africa too, but I think a lot of times Egypt gives the, the appearance, the, the connotation of more of a Middle Eastern, when in fact it's, it's Africa. Mostly all pyramids in the world are located in Africa. Um, so uh, as far as being more advanced, you know, African rulers and merchants already at that time, even, even years prior, uh, had established trade routes with the Mediterranean, Asia, uh, the Indian Ocean region, hundreds of years prior to, to European exploration. So, as I said, Africa already had a, a ready-made skill force in, in agriculture and craftsmanship. What it's, it's what exactly what the, the settlers needed in the, in the New World which brings us to the, 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 the 246 years of slavery, the, the I, won't, I won't even say importation, but the, you know, the, the, the movement of you know, close to 20 million Africans involuntarily to the United States. Um, most of those folks dying along the way, depending on you know, what the research says, between 15 and 30% of the Africans died during that, that trip from Africa to the United States. Um, and this is just an imagery of, of, of what a slave ship looked like. Um, and we can see that, you know, folks are, are just crammed in to that bottom middle section of the ship. 
making it right for the spread of communicable diseases. And when we talk about health, there you have it. That's one of the first examples of, of you know, health inequities, health being not a priority for black populations. Um, and, and the middle passage is often off, often confused with being that middle part of the ship, when in actuality, the middle passage was part of the, the trip from Africa to the United States. So the first part of the trip was the ship going from Europe to Africa. The middle passage is that trip from Africa to the United States. Third part of the trip is back to Europe from the Americas. So again, like I said, it's going to be high level. So we're going to we're going to skip some things and we're going to jump right to the end of slavery. Um, so 246 years later, later, um, and technically slavery ended in 1863, you know, with the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. However, it wasn't until Juneteenth, which was June 19th, 1865, when all slaves were free. All slaves realized that they were free. So, you know, two years later, after slavery ended, there was still slavery going on in Texas, in the southern states. Um, and again, it was part of partly some of that was just refusal of, of slave owners to, to give up their slaves. And another part was that word just hadn't spread yet. Um, and now here we are today, Juneteenth is, is last year finally recognized as a federal holiday, which is, is it's only fair and it, it caused some, some uproar. But the truth of the matter is that July 4th celebrates the freedom of the United States from British rule. But when you look at that, who became free in 1776? not the entire population of the United States. You know, the slaves at that time received uh, absolutely no, no impact from the, the July 4th um, celebration of becoming emancipated from British rule. So they were still not citizens, they were still property for many years to come and celebrating the freedom of all Americans even if it's on two separate dates, I think is, you know, fair and unjust and keyword equitable. And I know a lot of us have heard this phrase, freedom, freedom ain't free. And that could not be any more the case than with uh, slavery. So after slavery ended, we enter the, the era of Jim Crow and Jim Crow, these laws, these policies um, really, really set off the, the health inequities, the social determinants of health that we see still impacting African Americans, still impacting other priority populations. Um, even though these laws, these policies have been disbanded new laws created, new policies created, the history and the context and the some of the, the, the implicitness that is still maintained by folks who grew up during that time and are now in leadership positions still remains, unfortunately. So again, these laws and policies legally supported things um, including the segregation of parks, cemeteries, theaters, restaurants, all in an effort to, to keep blacks and whites um, separate. Um, and it was codified on local and state level, you know, some of some huge cases, Plessy versus Ferguson. I mean, these were policies put in place to prevent black people from living, obtaining their most optimal health, wealth, and education. Um, again, public parks, segregated waiting rooms, on um, bus stations, travel, um, separate facilities, almost everywhere you went was included in um, the, the Jim Crow era. 
So and again, when we talk about those social determinants of health, education, housing, the ability to vote, obtain health care, all of that is what we now know to be social determinants of health and things that we are trying to trying to make right, trying to trying to fix the ship, if you will, right the ship, if you will. So, you know, keeping in mind, getting back to tobacco during this time, um, you know, there wasn't there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot of black folks um, being being targeted to smoke. Um, also, at this time, menthol cigarettes hit the market. So in the early 1920s, um, menthol hit the market. Um, a man named Spud Webb created it. And also in this time, the tobacco industry was thriving, thriving at the hands of a lot of folks who were, you know, either either freed slaves or the des descendants of freed slaves. Where else were they going to work? You know, they already knew tobacco. So a lot of free slaves stayed on the farm as sharecroppers. A lot of uh, black folks back then did work at tobacco companies. Big tobacco was one of the first industries to really hire black folks. And that's kind of where the this, this strange unequal relationship between African-American communities and big tobacco, where that started. Um, so... 1920s menthol cigarettes are created, became super popular, exponential growth, and by the 50s, popularity rose so much that the big big brands got in on it. So we're talking Salem, we're talking Newports, they entered the market, and when in the 50s, early 60s. Now, at that time, African Americans were smoking menthols of a rate of about five percent. 1950s, 1960s, we see advertise, advertising just, just change completely from what we see here. Very, very offensive Sambo Piccaninny imagery to a lot more sophisticated, you know, appealing with big tobacco now realizing, hey, we, we want this segment of the population to, to smoke our cigarettes as well. And the, the connection to, between menthol, you know, no one can really pin it down. But the bottom line is African-Americans in, in that huge research arm of, of big tobacco was discovered that there's a slight preference for menthol. Took that, they ran with it. Here we are now from the 1950s to about 50 years later. African Americans are now smoking menthols close to 80%. Currently today, it's even higher. It's about 85, you know, almost 90% of African American smokers smoke menthol products. And again, we have a whole presentation on that, that marketing and, and how that came about um, that if folks are interested in. Please uh, shoot me an email. We can discuss that. Um, and here's just another example of what the what and how the images changed over time. Now, when we talk about the current status of, of African-American health, the social determinants of health being factors, you know, we can look directly back at this time, you know, this, this Jim Crow era, the, the 50s, the 60s, before, you know, right, right, right around the, the start of the civil rights era, we can look directly at some of these policies that were in place and see how they impacted health then and how they continue to impact African American health today. So redlining is, is a perfect example. And, you know, I think you know, supposedly everyone is free and equal, but, you know, the, the residual impact of, of redlining still exists today. We can look at census tracts and see the remnants of of redlining. We can look at where, you know, environmental waste is, where, you know, the, the water treatment plants and the garbage dumps are. Um, they're all going to be closer to Black neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods, minority neighborhoods, and all that, those environmental factors also, you know, have an impact on, on health 
inequities and, you know, cancer rates, COPD rates, immune, you know, uh, your, your, your immune system being a little bit weaker. There's so many connections there. And again, we still have the white part of town and the black part of town in a lot of places. And then when we look at the resources, so whether it's, you know, hospitals, schools, libraries, green spaces, there's definitely remnants of, of redlining there. And we see where those places are and where they're not. We see the lack of resources. We see the lack of, you know, good hospitals, the lack of ability to get good food. We see the, the, the predominant, a predominant number of corner stores, though, with poor food choices, coolers of alcoholic beverages, and of course, uh, a more higher density of, of tobacco retailers. And even with zip codes, you can look at zip codes, and your zip code will tell you what your life expectancy is. Now, with, the, with, with wealth being one of the biggest indicators of health, and home ownership being one of the greatest generational wealth builders for families, we can connect those dots and see how this is still impacting African-American health. So again, going back to that, that head start, while, while Europeans had centuries to own land, gain homes, gain equity, you know, African-Americans in a sense only, only had 60 years to, to do the same thing. So there's a lot of, a lot of catch up that, that needs to happen there. So there's really no amount of pulling up your bootstraps that can make up for a close to 600 year head start. And just to get back to the advertising a bit, um, the, the predatory nature of it, um, targeting some minority populations, you know, populations already impacted by health disparities and not limited to just African-Americans. We're talking poor folks, less educated folks, LGBTQ+, folks with mental health disorders, all smoke menthol at higher rates. And when we look at the, those marketing techniques, cheaper, um, more dense displays, more dense number of retailers in these neighborhoods. And, you know, and like I said, it worked. We see more of these priority populations smoking menthol. And what we know now is about 90% of cigarettes marketed in the United States have menthol. Even if they're not advertised as menthol, they contain some level of menthol. More than one third of all cigarettes in the United States are menthol. Then of course, Newport, second leading market share of, of all cigarettes. Um, so when, you know, it, it, it's the question arises, well, what's, what's big tobacco so afraid of about getting rid of menthol? This is why it's, it's, it's one third of the market. So clearly we can see that race has been a, a factor here. Uh, and, and that equates to racism. You know, a lot of folks don't want to use that word, but when there's, when there's policies and systems that were once in place and, you know, they're not in place technically anymore, but policies and systems that negatively impacted African-Americans abilities for health, wealth, and, and, and justice, you know, that's racism. And, and we have to applaud the CDC for, you know, finally declaring racism as a public health issue and, and also making health equity a, a priority policy. Now, with menthol cigarettes being, being a prime example of this, and side note, got to give the state of Massachusetts props for being one of the first states to really take this thing by the reins and pass statewide legislation. So we, um, we definitely use you all as, as examples when we're talking about the successful implementation of menthol bans. But one of my favorite people in the world who taught me so much about this field, um, Phil Gardner, um, one of his many quotes is that menthol cigarettes are unequal opportunity killers that disproportionately hook young people, African-Americans, and other people of color. 
And this quote comes from um, his urging of the FDA to, to ban menthol in all cigarettes, um, which the AATCLC, my organization, we've been in this fight for, for decades now. So it's nice to finally see some, some action actually happening. Now in 2009, we saw some action, but also a lot of inaction. Flavored cigarettes were banned in 2009 under the Family Smoking Prevention Act. So it was about protecting families. It was about preventing the initiation of smoking, excluding menthol, excluding one third of the market that uses menthol. The majority of smokers starting with a menthol product, but we'll, we'll, we're going to leave that flavor in. So that, that was, that was a, a big dust up. Um, and a lot happened between 09 and right now. But I'm going to skip to right now. I know I've got a few minutes left. Um, so to the present day, so last year, the FDA announced its plan to ban menthol and flavored cigars. Um, and this was, of course, after all the pushback. A citizen's petition was filed. A lawsuit was filed. So uh, a, more than a decade later, they finally said, okay, we've done our research. I know we've, we've seen everyone else's research, and, but we, we needed to do, do our own, I guess. Fine. Now we, here we are, April 2022. They have announced that they will indeed start the rulemaking process to ban menthol and flavored cigars, um, which is an important distinction. So it's not just one rule. There are two rules. One banning menthol as a characterizing flavor in cigarettes and one for banning all flavors in cigars. Now, that's, we, we applaud that, but there's a lot lacking. There's a lot of loopholes, a lot of opportunity for big tobacco to, um, you know, skirt some of this. And again, that's a whole other training that I would be glad to, to provide to folks at a later date. But just to, to give a, a brief overview, the, the public comments are open and they've been extended to August 2nd. How do you make a public comment? Well, here's a couple of links. Um, you can make comments on the, the menthol and the flavored cigar comment, which are the bottom two links. That takes you right to the FDA. And the top link is a link to the Center for Black Health and Equity page where, and actually I, I may need to correct that. That's, that link, we've already sent our comments in, I believe. But also on that link, there is a template for making a comment. You know, how do I make a comment? What do I say? Well, on that link, there is a link to, I need help creating my comment, something like that, which brings up a document. You can cut it, paste it, edit it, add some information, pick out some information if you want to, but it's a template um, supporting the ban on um, menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars that you can then just cut, paste, and send it off to the bottom two links. Um, and of course, we, we, we still encourage folks to, to work on state and local um, menthol restrictions if, if, you, if they haven't already. But like I said, Massachusetts is ahead of the game. Props to you guys on that. Um, and just as a, as, a, as a what if, if in 2009 menthol had been banned, this is a, a projection of the number of lives that could have been saved. So that 10%, 20, 30%, those are, if we would have seen a, a 10% reduction in smoking, including people that quit and people that never started. With 10, 20, and 30, we can see the numbers just increasing um, on how many lives would have been saved, not to mention how many children, how many family members, how many people in general would have been protected from exposure to secondhand smoke. Excuse me. So I think I did pretty good on my time. I got a couple of minutes for questions or we can just wait till the end. Um, so thank you all. And here is the link. And I think someone put it in the chat and I can also put a link in the chat. And this is just a really brief survey um, specifically to, to my section of this presentation. Um, so I would appreciate the feedback as would my leadership team. 
Um, so thank you, and I'll pass it back over to the facilitators. And if you want to take a couple of questions now, that's fine. If we want to wait until the end for the question and answer period, I'm, I'm good with that too. Thank you, Michael. We are going to move into Doris's presentation. We'll hold questions until the end. Sounds good. Thank you, Wanda, and thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. I am, as Wanda had said at the beginning, Doris Cullen, and I am a community engagement facilitator with the Massachusetts Tobacco Cessation and Prevention Program. If we can go to the next slide, I wanna ask, um, I just wanna start by asking us all to take a deep breath. Michael's presentation is a lot to hear and a lot to take in, especially for our colleagues of color experiencing the injustices on a daily basis. And I wanna take a moment to center ourselves with a quote from Desmond Tutu as we move to look at Massachusetts data and data specific to Western Massachusetts. If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor, Desmond Tutu. For me as a white person, this is particularly relevant. I must choose and intentionally act each and every day to push up a culture, a white supremacy culture that benefits white people, people that look like me and marginalizes people that look like Michael. If I do not choose justice and fairness, I am perpetuating harm and I am helping to maintain injustices that quite frankly, I don't wanna be a part of. In our efforts, not to be silent nor complicit. The Massachusetts Tobacco and Cessation Program has shifted our work to lead with racial justice and name and challenge where racism shows up in our work and in our programs. Next slide, please. And we acknowledge that even while Massachusetts is exceptional, as Michael has stated, and at times the first state to pass such an important and significant policies, such as a menthol restriction. We in Massachusetts are no exception to the racist history of our country. We therefore ground our staff and our programs with a shared understanding of the terms and definitions we use to tackle racism. Next slide. We borrow from David Wellman and define racism as a system of advantage based on race. Next slide. And while I won't get into the specific definitions here today, I do want to mention that racism does indeed show up in ourselves, each one of us, in our relationships with others, in our institutions, such as hospitals and health departments, and across our institutions, such that we see the links between where we live and our employment opportunities and our education and our health and life expectancy. Next slide, please. To that end, I wanna share with all of you the why statement of the Massachusetts Tobacco Cessation and Prevention Program. Why does MTCP focus on racial equity and structural racism? The history of structural racism, the public policies, institutional practices and social norms that together maintain racial hierarchies and its impact across the country and within the Commonwealth is often overlooked or unacknowledged. Yet it is pervasive and unmistakably harmful to everyone. The social marginalization and inequities that racism cultivates in housing, education, employment, the built in social environments and healthcare are felt across generations, most acutely in communities of color. Next slide, please. MTCP recognizes that systems of cultural oppression need to be acknowledged and repaired by the entities that helped create them. MTCP is committed to improving the quality of life for all Commonwealth residents while eliminating the marginalization and inequities that threaten the lives of communities of color who are disproportionately affected by tobacco-related exposure, disease, and death. Next 
Next slide, please. Beyond our shared language, we move to a deeper shared understanding of leading and naming racism in our work together. We agree that racism is a primary indicator of someone's health status. We lead with race explicitly, but not exclusively. We acknowledge and name the importance of intersectionality. We know that no one is solely one identity. Race, gender, sexual orientation, ableness, and the like are other ex examples of identities. We acknowledge that racial inequities persist in and across all systems, where we live, where we work, where we learn. We know that whites have advantages that people of color do not have. We know and demonstrate that other forms of identity alone do not explain the inequities. Oftentimes we are asked if socioeconomic status or class status explains the inequities. But even when we control for SES, we see persistent racial inequities. And we understand that there is no health equity without racial equity. This next slide is a visual to help illustrate the relationship of structural racism and tobacco related inequitable health outcomes. It'll be shared in the slide deck for your consideration. I want to turn now for us to consider how the history Michael shared and the perseverance of racism and health inequities in our culture show up in Massachusetts. Next slide. In a state that is often thought of as exceptional, leading the way in policy systems and environmental change. If you can skip ahead, Kelly, to the consideration for the price of tobacco and the retail availability of tobacco and nicotine products. Thank you. Next slide. In Boston, if we look here, we see before the menthol restriction went into effect, we saw lower prices for Newport cigarettes in neighborhoods with more black residents. Next slide. In Springfield, we saw and continue to see a higher percentage of tobacco retailers in areas of Springfield that were redlined by banking and federal government lending policies that Michael spoke of earlier. These are the redlined areas where people of color have been forced to live due to these racist policies and where we see greater numbers of tobacco retailers. Next slide, please. We see the same for Worcester, high concentrations of tobacco retailers in areas where historic policies have limited resources in those areas and have forced people of color and people with low income to live as they were excluded from areas deemed suitable for whites only. Next slide. This map shows us that across the state, 21% of tobacco retailers are located within 1,000 feet of a school. But if we take a closer look into our cities, we see that in Springfield, 24% of tobacco retailers are within 1,000 feet of a school. And in Worcester, 26%. And within Boston, 40%. Next slide, please. Not only is retailer proximity to schools and our children a concern, but so is retailer density. Retailer density is the number of retailers per 1,000 adult residents. Massachusetts cities and town, towns with higher retail density tend to have higher smoking prevalence compared to cities and towns with low retail density. We see this evident here in this map when we look closely at North Adams, which has a higher retail density and a smoking rate of 32%, three times the state average, compared with Boston with a lower retail density and a corresponding lower smoking rate of 16%. And while Boston overall has a low smoking rate within the city limits, large inequities exist by neighborhood. And those neighborhood Distinctions are along racial lines, as is the prevalence of smoking. 
Next slide, and we'll turn to look at quitting smoking and treatment services for smokers. In Massachusetts, as elsewhere across the country, we have seen that whites, white smokers are more likely to be screened for smoking, more likely to be given advice to quit, and more likely to be referred to evidence-based treatment. And because people of color are not screened, not advised, and not referred as often, people of color are more likely to experience tobacco-related disease, such as diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and cancer, and are more likely to die from tobacco-related illnesses. The next slide, this graph shows that Blacks report higher barriers to quitting than their white counterparts, including lack of access to treatment and confounding influences such as racism and lack of social support. If we go to the next slide, we'll start to consider the exposure of tobacco, of toxic tobacco smoke. Next slide. When we also see that black residents are more likely than whites to report general exposure to secondhand smoke and secondhand, ex secondhand smoke exposure at home. Again, this can be linked to historical and equitable housing policies of redlining and of racially restrictive covenants that kept people of color from purchasing in the suburbs of Massachusetts. It also has to do with the marketing by the tobacco industry in those very same redlined areas. Next slide. As Michael has shared, um, we can talk and think back about the exceptionalness of Massachusetts. Way back in 2009, President Obama did sign the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, which banned the sale of flavored cigarettes, but exempted mint and menthol, leaving black and brown bodies to continue to experience unnecessary and excessive disease and death. 10 years later, Massachusetts in 2019, the governor did sign an act to modernize tobacco control, which restricted the sale of menthol tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes, to smoking bars for on-site adult-only consumption. Details of the law will be found in the slide deck. Kelly, if you could go through a couple of the next slides and get us to, yes, thank you. Following the menthol restriction, what I want us to consider today and reflect upon is that while the law we passed is exceptional and leads in the country for state laws, again, we must remember that we must continue to be actively anti-racist. Because as I said at the beginning of this presentation, to be neutral, silent, and complicit is to oppress, to advantage white people and disadvantage marginalized people, including people of color, LGBTQ people, youth, and those who have disabilities. We must consider the possible unintended consequences of the Massachusetts menthol restriction, especially as other cities and states across our country look to Massachusetts for learnings, and while the federal government is also considered restrictions. We must also consider what work remains and lies outside the range of any one policy change. Next slide. What I want us to consider outlined on these next few slides is a couple of different topical areas. The first being youth. Some youth use nicotine to soothe themselves and our menthol policy does not address the emotional and physical needs of our youth. Also, those addicted may seek products other than menthol rather than quitting altogether. Youth may buy cigarettes, menthol cigarettes off the street or online to get the menthol they cannot get in Massachusetts stores. And those youth living near state lines may buy menthol products in bordering states. These are the things we must consider. Next slide considers what we need to look at specifically for people of color 
because they too may switch to other tobacco products rather than just quitting smoking with limited tobacco menthol availability. We must also understand that while we seek to raise up the health of black and brown bodies in Massachusetts, simultaneously, there is the great potential for economic loss to the tobacco industry. This monetary loss can lead the industry to engage with well-respected black leaders, leaders such as Al Sharpton, to publicly speak out against menthol restrictions as unfair to people of color. And even though, even though there is no possession penalties in this law, we must acknowledge given our history and our present state in our country, there is a real concern that black and brown people may be profiled and perhaps harmed or even killed for having menthol cigarettes in their possession. On the next slide, we must consider why some people are trying menthol vape products as a means to switch or quit combustible products, this law may make it harder for them to access menthol vape products. And we must be ready because history has shown us again and again that the industry will introduce new products whenever restrictions are placed on their existing products. Next slide, please. And we must continue to consider the data and to be actively anti-racist and not complicit. This map shows us that while the law allowed for establishments to apply for a license to operate an adult only smoking bar to sell menthol cigarettes for on-site com consumption, what the data shows is that these bars are actually located consistently in communities of color. For the 25 licensed smoking bars in the state of Massachusetts, 11 are in Worcester and five are in Springfield. Next slide, please. If we look at this slide and dig a, be, a bit deeper into Springfield, for instance, we see that all of the five smoking bars in Springfield are located in census blocks with three environmental justice criteria. And if you're not familiar with the environmental justice criteria, they include high number of people of color, high number of people with low socioeconomic status, and a high number of people of non-English speaking background. In Worcester, we see a similar pattern. Next slide, please. As we consider what the existence of the presence of menthol smoke shops and communities of color means in terms of perpetuating tobacco related health inequities, we must also look beyond tobacco. We also need to consider the interconnectedness of tobacco and other substances and what policies may undermine the decades of work to eliminate tobacco smoking as a norm. For example, consideration is being given for cannabis establishments to allow for the smoking of tobacco and other nicotine products in their establishments. This could greatly expand the number of establishments with a, which allow smoking both marijuana and menthol cigarettes. It would weaken the smoke-free workplace law and it would likely contribute to greater health inequities. Next slide, please. We therefore want to pause and consider a few ideas of what more we in Massachusetts can do, what we can do to strive to be exceptional, to strive for equity and racial justice in our policies and practices. What can we do to be actively racist? Can we in healthcare and public health develop and strengthen our trustworthiness rather than question why people of color may not trust our healthcare institutions, given the history of violence and experimentation with patients of color? Can we begin to name and address our own and our institutions implicit biases that see white people as the norm and better than people of color? Can we examine and change our systems such that people of color and white people are 
all screened for tobacco, referred for treatment, and asked about what kinds of treatment they want? Can we consider what it might look like to have a system and policy change that prevents and treats the trauma of adverse childhood experiences and adverse childhood environments? And can we center healing? Can we have Michael's history lessons be part of our educational systems teachings? Can we deliberately and intentionally consider the effects of retailers, tobacco, marijuana, lottery, alcohol, all the retailers and their influences in our communities? And finally, as an example, can we consider what might happen when we allow for exemptions in our law? Who might those exemptions help and who might those exceptions, exemptions harm? Next slide, please. Again, I want us to take another deep breath. This is a lot of information to digest, a lot of information right from our own communities in which we live in. And I want to bring forth these words from James Baldwin. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So I ask from each of you on the next slide to take with you a homework assignment and ask yourself the following question. What can I do within my sphere of influence why prioritizing and centering racial equity and supporting each person to achieve their optimal health. But please don't stop with just the answer in your head to the question. Please act, intentionally act to not be complicit in a system that harms each and every one of us, our colleagues and the people we love. Thank you so much. I think we'll turn it back for questions. Thank you, thank you, Doris, and thank you, Michael. Those were both very informative presentations and we want to open it up to questions. And we have a couple of questions for you to respond to. The first question is, we know that marketing strategies are focused on urban areas. What can the local excuse me, municipalities do to control tobacco product marketing schemes? Well, that, that's an awesome question because some places, because of preemption, they may not be able to do anything. Um, but one of the best ways to do it is like through a, a, a good neighbors type of program where you, whether it's the, the health department or a community group, you know, just talk to the retailers about the, the, the advertising, the plethora of advertising. And the challenge there becomes a lot of these retailers are paid a little extra to plaster those those advertisements, um, and then Doris, I'm not sure if you if you all did anything around that in in, in while you were implementing your um your your ban there in Massachusetts, but that is a, a, a awesome question because that advertisement is 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 the, a proven tactic that works, especially in African American communities and especially in um, areas close to schools. Yeah, Michael, thank you. We, we in Massachusetts had the um, ability to, with our local programs and our local youth chapters as well, to document what that marketing looks like in communities of color in particular. And then they worked um, with the legislature to change some of those laws to get removed power walls of all tobacco um, products and to get tobacco also moved um, behind the counter as well. So I encourage people to document, work with people that are in um, tobacco cessation and prevention programs to show up what's, what's happening in communities and raise your voice around that. Great, thank you. Um, somewhat of a follow-up to that, are there uh, messages or curricula particularly for youth that you have found to be successful? I, 
I would I, I would suggest um, looking up the the Truth Campaign and Youth Empowered Solutions. Um, their specialty is, is youth focused work, and while I've done some work with them, um, you know they're they're the the that's their, that's their wheelhouse extensively. But what I can say is messaging to youth that focuses around them being targeted them being agents of change that can stop this that can play that can play a major role in stopping this has definitely proven to to be impactful and and useful um and i've seen that with uh some groups that i've worked with in in new york in um uh, a colleague of mine in, in louisiana so especially the the youth today with their social media and their 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 sense of wokeness um being able to to really push back and say we're not going to take it anymore and this is this is our power has proven to to be very very effective yeah we've had some recent um local communities using the catch curriculum as well and we can put some of those resources when we circulate um the slides and put them on the Public Health Institute's website as well. Thank you, that would be great. Next question, is the vaping industry following the tobacco pattern and over-marketing to communities of youth and of people of color? There's a quick answer to that, yes. <laughs> but I don't know if folks have heard, and it was just announced yesterday, Jewel is out of here. Jewel, the FDA yeah. signed it off. Jewel, if you go into a store today, Jewel's should be gone. Their application was denied. They cannot sell their products in the United States. So, and all of that was because of how they marketed to kids and how their application did not disprove their targeting of minors and the you know, the one of the things they a couple of the things that they said in their application was like, this is this helps people stop smoking. They were not able to prove that. Um, so the quick and dirty answer is, is yes. Um, there was another piece to that. Did I answer the whole question? It seems like there was like a two pieces to that question. No, I think you answered it. It was whether okay. or not. Yeah. Whether the patterns uh, are the same. Yeah. Yeah. That's tobacco. And that, that's one thing we can we can depend on Big Tobacco to do is use the same techniques, the same patterns. Michael, can you speak to, do you know where the highest smoking rates are found worldwide? Uh, worldwide, um, and I, I, when I saw that, I, I said, let me hit Google real quick, because I wasn't, <laughs> I, know, I know Southeast Asia does have very high smoking rates, but surprisingly not the highest in the world because the highest in the world is in a uh, an independent island nation off of Australia called uh, Nehru, where the rate is 52%. Um, the Balkans, between all of the, the countries in the Balkans, Serbia, Greece, Croatia, it hovers between 30 something percent and 40%. So again, extremely high. Um, and then for Southeast Asia, um, it's, it's and it varies because some places it's extremely high in the 40s and 50s and other places it's, it's in the teens. But I guess, you know, average wise, those, those three places are, are in the world are, are where some of the, the, the highest smoking rates are. And I, di I didn't have time to really dig into the rabbit hole and see what the menthol rates are. But again, let's not forget, menthol is in 90% of tobacco products. This rule is banning menthol as a characterizing flavor. How much menthol makes it a characterizing flavor? They haven't said. So in the comment section, um, and this, this is part of what's included in our, our public comment um, training is things that need to be included in this ruling. One of which is you need to, the FDA needs to clearly state what makes, what level of menthol makes it a characterizing flavor. Mm -hmm. Ideally, we want menthol out, period. Um, but that's one of the things that, that 
we're pushing for. And also it does not include e-cigarettes. So while, while Juul is off the market, there are still other e-products that are on the market and available in, in mint and in menthol. Last question, and this is to both of you. How has understanding the history of tobacco and health helped you to address issues in the work that you do today? Well, for one, it's, it's helped me really understand the, the, the whys of some of the, these health inequities that we see. Because when you look at the health inequities of, of African Americans, the uh, you know the top five causes of death, you know all of them are directly related to tobacco use, and it also made me realize that this this information isn't getting out enough. Prior to working at the Center for Black Health and Equity, I did tobacco prevention work um, in the state of North Carolina in, in Durham County. And when I trans transitioned over to, to the Center for Black Health and Equity, I learned so much more that I didn't know while I was the tobacco educator for the county of Durham. So I think to myself, I could have been doing so much more mm. had I known this information, you know, had I known that this organization, at the time we were still napping the National African American Tobacco Prevention Network, you know, and the health department literally were located on the same street. And I had no idea that they existed. And I think that in, over the last six years that I've been there, we've done a lot to get our name out there. We've done a lot to, to let folks know that we exist. Um, but yeah, I think that um, knowing that history is, is extremely important, not just for folks working in public health, but the public in general, mm. because a lot of times that that lights a fire under folks that want to quit, under folks that, um, you know, are allies in the sense of, you know, being woke and wanting to see social justice, racial justice, wanting to see that healing and, and connecting the dots and including tobacco. Because tobacco is a big piece of that, although, you know, police brutality, you know, holding folks back from voting, all that gets the spotlight a lot of times, deservingly. Um, but the, the, the fact that tobacco is intertwined in all of that kind of, kind of gets lost, lost in the sauce. Thank you, Michael. Doris? Yeah, I think for me, tracing back the the history of tobacco really showed for me where structural racism shows up in all the areas of the, as we call them, the social determinants of health as it relates to tobacco. So we oftentimes talk a lot about the tobacco industry capitalizing on the history of redlining, for instance, and marketing in um, communities of color, but it also gave me the opportunity to give pause to see where does structural racism show up also in our healthcare around tobacco. In fact, like the data showing that we are not um, screening for tobacco among people of color, we're not referring people of color as often to for treatment. And it also makes me think not only of where it shows up in healthcare, but as the other question had talked about patterns and where we see patterns between vaping and combustible tobacco, those are some of the same patterns we see in other areas. We mentioned the tobacco, um, the other retailers, the cannabis retailers, the lottery retailers, the alcohol retailers. We see those same racist policies and practices um, among those venues too in our communities. And it really sheds a light on the interconnectedness of racism in our institutions, in our communities, and the need to address that explicitly. 
And I just saw a comment in the um, in the chat around the the, the Mike Brown killing, mm -hmm. and uh, this is a, a a tactic that Big Tobacco has been using is you know co-opting the current situation around the, uh, the uh, proliferation of racial killings and how they're related to tobacco. Now, there's reports, and we get different reports here, different reports there. But the one thing we do know, um, in, in the Mike Brown case, that was um, not selling cigarettes. That was, there was another man um, in New York, and they're trying to sell because he was selling Lucy's. But the bottom line to that is, take away all these incidences where they try to bring tobacco into it and what's left. Dozens of more where tobacco had no relationship to it. The unjust treatment of African-Americans, poor folks, brown folks, by the hands of, of law enforcement existed long before this menthol piece was a conversation. If anyone was on the listening sessions for the, for the FDA, um, law enforcement jumped on and, and spoke on this and admittedly said that using creative policing would give them the opportunity to approach someone holding a cigarette to then engage them. Oh, are you holding drugs? Are you wanted? Which in and of itself, that's completely illegal. And this officer got on and said, that's the tactic that they use. It says a whole lot about big tobacco, their supporters. And like Doris mentioned, a lot of these folks are being paid by the big, big tobacco. Um, but that's, that's a great question about the Mike Brown thing, because Big Tobacco has co-opted the parents, the mothers, to come and speak against it, you know, saying that if it wasn't for that, you know, my son would still be alive. And, that, and that's truly misconstruing it and buying sympathy, buying, buying support, because the African-American community right now is so sensitive to these police injustices. Um, and it's unfortunate that these, that these messages get out there like that, but that's, again, Big Tobacco's game plan. That's their, their, their method methodology is to stretch it and frame it the way that will um, you know, garner support um, um, to, to their side. So, None of these incidents were um, directly related to he's got a cigarette, he's smoking a cigarette, he, he sold an illegal cigarette. This is why the interaction started. Um, so that's really, I mean, and, and that's one of the things that we, that we talk about is, and Doris mentioned it, these, these unintended consequences that big tobacco is, is pushing out that, that could happen. Um, and here's how it happened from their perspective, from their framing. So I would just encourage folks that when you, when you see this, when you see that, you know, go back and, and look for the, 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 the other side of the story. Um, and a lot of times you will find that, oh, okay, I see how it was stretched or how it was manipulated to sound like that. But the reality of it is, was this. Um, and that's, that's just the way media and social media works today, unfortunately. Um, Correct. And that, that's one of the challenging parts of all this. Well, thank you. I want to just extend a big thank you to both Michael Scott and Doris Cullen for educating us today. This has been a great webinar. I'd like to remind everybody to please take a moment to fill out both of the surveys. Your feedback is important to us. And thank you again. We will be sending out the slides and additional information. So thank you. I hope everyone has enjoyed this. And have a thank good you. weekend. Well Appreciate yes. it. Yes. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.